Good day. Today, Thursday, 18th April, at least as of the time of my making of this program, there has still been no attack by Israel on Iran or on any Iranian target. I still believe, in fact, I am sure that an attack is coming, and it's been suggested that it will happen shortly after the conclusion of the Jewish Passover. Others say the weekend, well, we'll just have to wait and see. But soon, I have no doubt, the attack will come. It's also clear to me that there is an enormous amount of anger and recrimination and hand-wringing going on behind the scenes, both within Israel and between Israel and some of its friends. The Israeli cabinet is clearly being pulled in different directions. Some, uh, me some of its members are concerned about um, the weakening of support that Israel is alleged to be receiving from its friends. Others feel that this can be disregarded anyway and that Israel should plunge ahead regardless of what its friends think and should launch a strike against Iran on whatever scale it considers it can. Well, we'll see what happens. There's a number of things to say. First of all, um, the British Foreign Minister, David Cameron, former Prime Minister, has uh, been in uh, contact with the Israeli government, has apparently spoken with no less a person than Prime Minister Netanyahu. He came, Cameron came, with the usual urgings of restraint that we're now getting publicly from all Western governments. To the best of my understanding, um, Netanyahu basically told Cameron to get lost, telling him that Israel will make whatever decision it chooses and that it's not going to take lessons from the British and from Foreign Secretary Cameron in particular. So that's one diplomatic move that Cameron has made, um, which has not achieved anything. I should say that Foreign Secretary Cameron's record so far has not been particularly successful as Foreign Secretary. He had a failed visit to the United States where um, he didn't get on with Donald Trump, annoyed the Democrats by meeting Donald Trump and got the door slammed in his face by Speaker Mike Johnson. And um, now, as I said, he's encountered a similar rebuff from, Prime, uh, from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I think the sooner the British and some of the European countries understand how limited their leverage and influence has become in global affairs, the better it will be for them. They can start, in that case, to shape their foreign policies in an altogether more realistic way. For the rest, President Putin of Russia has had a telephone conversation with the Iranian president, Ebrahim Raisi. Over the course of it, and as confirmed by the Kremlin readout, um, President Putin made clear Russia's strong disapproval, indeed condemnation, of the Israeli attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Now, interestingly, the Iranians waited about an hour before they, before the, after the publication of the Russian readout, before they published a readout of their own. There's a good discussion of this, again, by John Helmer, um, on his indispensable website, Dances with Bears. If you go to that website, you will see that the Russian readout, as always, suggests a rather measured conversation between Raisi and Putin. Putin condemns the attack on the embassy in uh, Damascus. 
indicates overall Russian support for Iran, um, seeks a containment of the situation in the Middle East, and then Raisi and Putin, according to the Russian readout, move on to discuss the general state of relations between Iran and Russia. The Iranian readout is very different, at least perhaps not so much in substance as in tone, because it purports to quote Putin's actual words. And they imply that Putin's support for Iran over the course of the telephone call was far more forthright than the Russian readout might lead one to think. Anyway, there we go. I wonder what the Russians make of this, how they feel about the Iranians publishing, presumably without permission, um, Putin's actual words, if those were Putin's words. Um, the Russians are still trying to maintain some kind of contacts with Israel. Their, uh, Putin's national security advisor, Nikolai Petrushev, spoke uh, a couple of days ago to Benjamin Netanyahu's national security advisor. I think the Russians will not be pleased that the Iranians have gone as far as they have done. But realistically, in this very tense situation, it's not entirely surprising that the Iranians, who want to broadcast to the world the level of support that they're receiving, have done what they did. And I doubt that there's very much that the Russians can do about it. Anyway, interesting exchange between Putin and Raisi. For a full account of the two readouts, go to Dances with Bears, as I said, John Helmer's um, uh, site, um, where he discusses the two readouts in detail. In the meantime, we've now also had an article in the Wall Street Journal, which tells us that the United States was absolutely furious when it learned about the Israeli attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. They were angry not to be consulted. They were angry about the casual way in which Israel carried out the attack. Um, they felt that the Israelis um, did not understand or appreciate the significance of the attack that they were carrying out and discounted the possibility that this attack would result in a strong Iranian reaction. Well, that's in the Wall Street Journal. And of course, it is absolutely typical of the way in which the United States has been acting. Or at least I say the United States, I should make it clear, I mean the Biden administration has been behaving ever since the crisis on the 7th of October. The, the crisis began, the current crisis began on the 7th of October with the Hamas attack on Israel. In private, they express concern about Israel's behavior. They brief journalists, often anonymously, about their annoyance that the Israelis are overstepping all kinds of red lines, that the Israelis are acting in a counterproductive and inappropriate way. They um, suggest, they imply that the United States, that the Biden administration is trying to persuade Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Israeli cabinet to exercise more restraint than it does. And supposedly they're becoming more and more infuriated and frustrated and exasperated as Israel continues to escalate both in Gaza and now against Iran with this strike on the embassy building in Damascus. However, in public, they it's a completely different story. In public, the United States stands four square behind Israel, gives Israel unlimited support, provides Israel with the weapons it needs to conduct the military offensive in Gaza. 
backs Israel to the hilt in the confrontation with Iran and, as we see, seen, refuses to criticize publicly the Israeli attack on the embassy in Damascus and refuses to allow the Security Council to criticize the Israeli attack on the embassy in, Damas in Damascus. And now things are going to take a further step um, of that nature because despite lots of talk over the last few weeks and months about how the United States wants eventually to see a Palestinian state established, how it wants Israel and the Palestinians to move towards a negotiated solution of the conflict, despite similar words from Britain, it seems that the United States and Britain are cranking up to veto a resolution that is now um, finding its way through the Security Council, which would recognize the Palestinian Authority as the government of the Palestinian state, and which would grant the state of Palestine full voting rights in the United Nations. The United States and Britain speaking incessantly about the need for international recognition of a Palestinian state are now saying that that can only happen once Israel agrees as part of a negotiating process, which of course, in effect, gives Israel a veto over the entire process. Well, I don't think this is convincing or practical. I think that these attempts by the United States, because that's what they are, to distance themselves from what is coming, are not going to be well received in many places in the world. There will, I am sure, be an attack by Israel on Iran. All the indications now are that, as invariably happens in any matter relating to Israel, Israel is choosing, is opting for the hardest, most kinetic, most forceful possible line, because that is the line that Israel, or at least its government and political system, are hardwired to take, and that has been true pretty much for as long as I can remember. So it is highly likely that we are going to see some kind of Israeli attack on Iran, and it is highly likely that the Iranians are going to respond, because realistically, they don't have much choice. They've already said that if there's an attack on their territory, they will have to retaliate. And we are now trapped in a cycle of escalation. To say it again, and very straightforwardly, the only way that this could be prevented from happening is if the Biden administration were prepared to do that one thing which it has never shown any ability to do, which is to say publicly to Israel, stop, and to say to the Israeli authorities that unless you stop, the United States will take action, such as interrupting arms supplies, withdrawing loan guarantees, affecting that long, wide range of mechanisms that the United States could, if it was minded to use them, bring to bear in order to bring the situation under control. There may be some people within the administration who would support doing something like that. It's quite clear, and logic clearly shows, that the United States does not want or need at this particular time a wider war in the Middle East, but the administration itself is hardly united on this question, and it's, it 
would be probably more that the administration could do to unite on a policy of public pressure against Israel. And were it to try to do that, the wider political class, Congress, much of the media would stack up against it. And speaking of the media, by the way, um, some of the coverage, some of the reporting that I have seen, including, by the way, and perhaps especially in Britain, has been furious to the point of outright hysteria about the Biden administration's feeble attempts to bring the whole situation under control. I've seen the word appeasement thrown around incessantly and all over the place, and people accusing the Biden administration not just of seeking to appease Iran, but actually of wanting to assist Iran in some way, though I have no idea what these people who write like this are talking about. Anyway, there we are. Now, just to recap, one thing we have seen over the last couple of days, in fact, what we saw over the weekend, is the extent to which Israel does, in fact, depend on its friends and allies um, in any confrontation in the Middle East. Now, the Iranians, as we know, launched their 300 drone <laughs> and rocket and missile attacks on Israel over the weekend. They telegraphed their intentions days in advance. They apparently briefed the Americans on what they were going to do. Again, people, some people are skeptical about this, but there's reports about this all over the media now. Um, it has never been denied, by the way. The United States has never formally de denied that it was in contact with Iran and had received a great deal of information from Iran. The only thing that they've denied is that they denied that they were told in advance by the, Israeli, by the Iranians when the attack would happen. But that article in the Financial Times on the 12th of April tells us otherwise. Anyway, um, what that attack nonetheless did show is that for all the capabilities, which are real, I've no doubt about that, of Israel's Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow air defense systems, ultimately, the Israelis depend very heavily on support from the United States. Apparently, there were AWACS, American AWACS aircraft in the sky, tracking the movement of Iranian drones and missiles, cruise missiles. Um, as we know, American and British and French fighter jets were operating, shooting down drones and missiles. All of this was being conducted on a huge scale. And, well, I can't say this for certain because it's beyond my ability to assess these things. But I suspect that if that assistance had not been provided on that kind of scale, the strong likelihood is that an awful lot more missiles and rockets and drones and uh, the rest would have got through and more damage, significantly more damage, would have been done. So there we go. The Israelis have to rely on their friends and allies for their defense, despite all the bombastic assertions of Israeli power. And nonetheless, <laughs> despite that, the Israelis happy to receive this assistance, of course, but apparently unwilling to listen to their friends and allies' concerns, plunging ahead with an attack, a planned attack on Iran, which their allies and friends have told them in private and have indicated in public through the usual sources that they don't want to see happen. There we go. Um, if you indulge someone incessantly in this fashion, 
And don't be surprised, I suppose, if they take your support for granted and don't take your warnings and your expressions of concern seriously. Now, as to the form an Israeli attack on Iran will take, I'm not in a position to say. I don't know much about Israeli capabilities. A glance at a map suggests that if Israeli fighter jets um, are going to conduct a strike against Iran, then they would have to get the permission of various Arab states to fly over their airspace. I don't think that can be taken for granted. I'm also told that Israel does not have the capabilities to refuel its aircraft, as would be needed to, if a strike like that were to be conducted from the air. So perhaps, probably, if all this is true, then the most likely attack is will happen by sea. Israel has apparently submarines which are capable of launching cruise or ballistic missiles and probably that is what we will see being used to deliver the strike against Iran. We're told, well I understand, that an attack of that kind, if it is limited, if it is indeed limited to cruise and ballistic missiles launched by sea, is unlikely to do any significant damage to Iranian installations. Now, in my last two programs, I have spoken at length, but in a very cautious and perhaps uninformative way, about reports in Russia about Iran possessing capabilities that it has not so far publicly disclosed and about the concern that this is causing in Russia. I've now received further reports from which appear to be sourced from Israel and which appear to be corroborated to some extent by publications that I've been shown which have appeared in Israel as well which suggests that the Israelis themselves are also aware of these capabilities, these Iranian capabilities. And I understand, or at least I'm told, that it is knowledge of these capabilities which is acting as a greater constraint on Israel than the urgings and warnings of the United States and of the Western powers to exercise restraint and perhaps to forego an attack on Iran altogether. If so, then it looks as if Iran does have a deterrent capability which might already be having some effect, in which case one can understand why Israel, for its part, might need the support of its friends even more. This is an incredibly dangerous situation and it is showing every sign of getting out of control and perhaps the most obvious indicator of growing alarm on the part of at least some people is the extraordinary increase in the price of gold that we have seen over the last few weeks, which suggests that someone, somewhere, someone with deep pockets is becoming increasingly alarmed about the situation. Gold being the hedge people turn to in times of trouble. Anyway, there's one final point I want to make about all of this, which is this whole situation, which I think I'm going to get some pushback on, but which I think must be said, which is whenever the subject, the topic of Iran and its relations with Israel is discussed, one always comes across this theme that the Iranian leadership is a fanatical, sectarian, 
religious um, leadership um, filled with some kind of eschatological ambition which somehow requires it to work towards the destruction of the state of Israel and that the leadership of Iran is prepared to acquire nuclear weapons in order to achieve that and is prepared to use those nuclear weapons because far from fearing the apocalypse which that would result in at some level apparently it even welcomes it there's absolutely nothing about iran and the way it has conducted itself as a state that suggests to me that this image of iran is correct the islamic republic of iran has existed in its current form for roughly 45 years ever since the fall of the shah since then it has been involved in one major war the iran iraq war which was waged against it by uh, saddam hussein who received a certain amount of help in fact a great amount of help from the western powers and by the way the soviet union um, and which was not sought at the time by iran the war was devastating for iran and has still left major scars on Iranian society. As several people from Iran, all of them, by the way, because all of the Iranians I know are critics of the current government, have pointed out to me. Anyway, that's the um, first thing I would say. For the rest, I can't really see much evidence that Iran has been involved in any war of choice in any place. It has worked hard to establish a network of alliances in the Middle East with Hezbollah, with the Syrian government, with various militias in Iraq. But I've always myself felt that these, whilst they clearly, these alliances, whilst they clearly reflect Iran's quest for regional influence, also are intended to a great extent to provide Iran with regional allies in case it finds itself in a similar sort of war as the one that it faced in the 1980s when it was attacked by Saddam Hussein's Iraq. If you listen and read and follow the statements of Iranian leaders, including the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, I really cannot see any comment from them which remotely corresponds to this fanatical and apocalyptic vision that people speak about. Um, my impression is of a government that has prioritized, first and foremost, Iran's position in the Middle East and security and the preservation of the Islamic state that was created in Iran as a product of the revolution of the 1970s, which overthrew the Shah. I just do not see any indication that Iran is driven by this kind of apocalyptic eschatological vision that people talk about. And of course, given that Iran has existed in its current form, the Islamic State of Iran, the Islamic Republic, has existed for 45 years, one would expect that if Iranian leaders really held to those kind of beliefs, they would have acted on them by now, which to all intents and purposes, they have not done. So, I don't share this view. It seems to me that in terms of its conduct of international relations, including its relations with its neighbours, Iran behaves 
pretty much like all the other Middle Eastern states and um, is not, certainly is not interested in conducting actions that it knows would lead to its own destruction. So there we are. That's what I would say. Now, if one does want to seek people with eschatological views which are disturbing. One can find plenty of people like that in the Middle East. Um, some of the jihadi organizations that have caused so much trouble. ISIS, for example, certainly contain people, in fact, are led by people who have those sort of views. And I have to say, I remain deeply concerned by some of the comments that come from what I suspect still is a fringe, but a growing and very powerful fringe in Israel, including some people who seem to have managed to um, get places in the Israeli cabinet and who talk about re-establishing the temple in Jerusalem and who are apparently now saying that the time has come to resume animal sacrifices as a first step to restoring the temple. All of that it seems to me worrying and disturbing, to say the least. And of course, if it results in an actual attempt to seize control of the Temple Mount and to dismantle the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, as many people are fearing, well, the consequences of that would be beyond dramatic. In fact, I don't want to contemplate them. But anyway, my purpose in making these observations is that I think that people need to calm down about Iran. I certainly do not think that it is the kind of country that I see regularly described in much of the media and in a lot of the commentary. Um, as I said, I've followed Iranian actions. They all seem to me to be fully explicable by fully ex explicable in terms of Iranian national self-interest and fall squarely within the sort of policies that you would expect an Iranian government, any Iranian government, to follow, considering the conditions of the Middle East at this particular point in time. Anyway, that's my summary at the moment of the situation in the Middle East. Let's turn now to that other war, the war in Ukraine. Now, in my program yesterday, I began um, by mentioning, or at least I mentioned, um, a major missile strike, apparently using Atakam's missiles, that Ukraine had conducted on the Russian air base of Jankoy in Crimea. And uh, Aribar, as I also mentioned yesterday, said that 12 Atakam's missiles had been launched and said that several of them were shot down. He later said that most of them were shot down, um, but some did get through and did cause actual damage. And in fact, for much of yesterday, there were um, claims pouring out of Ukraine that the missiles had been targeting air defense installations around the Jankoy base, S-400 missile systems, and S-300 missile systems, and that these air defense um, systems had been successfully destroyed as a result of this attack and strike. Well, it does seem that the Russians did succeed in shooting down some of these attack and missiles. Not all of them got through. It's unclear how many did. Um, Dima at the military su summary channel seems to suggest it might have been six, in other words, half of the number that were launched. Who's to <laughs> say exactly? I, I'm not going to try and second guess that. 
But one thing seems to be irrefutable and seems to be confirmed by the satellite and photographic evidence, which is that the missiles did, which did get through did not destroy any Russian air defense installations. It's clear to me that the Russians got wind of this attack sometime in advance. Perhaps they didn't know when the attack specifically would come, on which particular day. <clears throat> Perhaps they deduced that there would be an attack on the Jankoi base when they learned <clears throat> um, earlier this year that the United States was supplying to um, Ukraine more attackums um, missiles. Anyway, the result was that the S-400 and S-300 systems that had been located around the Jankoi base were withdrawn sometime probably at the end of March, <coughs> so that when the attack finally came, it hit nothing of substance. I mean, some damage to the base has been done, but the Russians basically sidestepped the attack and the air defense systems were not were not hit. Now, again, I'm going to make my own brief conclusions about this attack. Um, Ukraine has expended, according to Rebar, 12 valuable attackums missiles. The United States, and we're going to come to that in a moment, looks certain now to supply a lot more attackums missiles to Ukraine, despite the fact that the Pentagon itself as I understand it, is very unhappy about that idea. However, attackums missiles like Patriot missiles are in finite supply, or in fact, indeed, in short supply, and the United States needs them in all sorts of different places, especially in the Pacific region. Um, the attackums itself is no longer in production. The United States is still developing its successor, which is also still not in production. That means that there is only a limited stockpile of these systems. And whilst more systems like this can be supplied to Ukraine, as I said, there is not an infinite number of them. So what Ukraine has now done is that it has used up 12 valuable expensive, irreplaceable attackums missiles to achieve essentially nothing. This is not a good trade, to say it simply. No doubt we are going to get more attackums missile strikes over the next couple of days, probably this weekend, perhaps even sooner than that. No doubt we will see attempts to use attackums missiles to strike at the Crimean Bridge. And of course, there's a possibility that some of these missiles will indeed get through. But whatever, <laughs> these missiles by themselves are not going to change the outcome of the war. They're not going to affect the actual developments on the front lines, which we're going to come to shortly. They cannot match the immeasurably stronger capabilities that the Russians possess in the missile and air war. And all that they're doing is dwindling Western spot stockpiles of a precious and limited resource. We can see this how this has already happened with the storm shadows and the scalps, scalp missiles that Britain and France supplied to Ukraine. Ukraine has been launching scores of these systems since they started to arrive in Ukraine in the autumn. Their effectiveness has steadily declined. Their number has steadily declined. Apparently the stockpiles, both in Britain and France, are now running down. Neither of these systems is apparently currently in production. By the way, the German Taurus missile, which the Germans have refused to supply 
is also apparently no longer in production. The Germans have just ceased production of the Taurus missile. So what is happening is that the Ukrainians are burning through Western stockpiles of valuable weapons to achieve nothing of any significance. Even if they hit the Crimean Bridge, even if they cause it damage, the day when that mattered has passed. The Russians already have railway links to Crimea. They're able to supply Crimea through its ports. They don't need the Crimean Bridge in the way that they did before the special military operation began. And destroying the Crimean Bridge, as those German generals admitted, is not going to affect or change in any significant way the outcome of the war. The Americans, the British, the French, the Germans, continue, however, to do this. They encounter, they get from the Ukrainians shrill demands, incessant demands for more and more weapons, more and more missiles, more and more um, high Mars rockets, more and more armored vehicles, more aircraft, more of everything. The Ukrainians show no interest in or concern for the fact that these are limited resources that the West does not have in unlimited quantities. The Ukrainians burn through these resources at speeds that the Western powers are always dismayed by. But then, of course, once the resources are burnt through, the Ukrainians simply come back with more and greater demands. These demands find a ready echo in parts of the Western media where um, a community of people exists that is determined to persuade everybody that the only reason why Ukraine hasn't won the war is because the West isn't giving Ukraine the weapons that it needs and wants. The result is after much hesitation and dithering, the weapons in the end are supplied. They don't make any difference. The cycle repeats itself. And at the end, all we're left with is a West with fewer weapons. It is one of the strangest things about this war, um, the way in which, through its unlimited, open-ended support for Ukraine, the West is disarming itself, even as challenges around the world, in the Middle East, as we've seen, in the Pacific, potentially, in all sorts of other places are steadily increasing. And all I have to add to that is that the sense of entitlement that the Ukrainians have repeatedly shown is astonishing. Their insistence that they must have everything that they demand and that they will not negotiate under any circumstances. They will not draw back in any way from their maximalist de demands. Well, that is astonishing as well. And it ought to cause more exasperation and frustration in Western capitals than it appears that it does. Anyway, there we are. So an unsuccessful missile strike by Ukraine against the Jankoy base one which has burnt through 12 more Attackham's missiles. Let's now turn to what else is happening. Now, I've said that there, are, that there have been more Russian missile attacks. We're still getting reports, uh, or at least claims, not reports, that these Russian missile attacks on that Ukrainian base in Slavyansk and the, that Ukrainian base in Chuguyev killed important people. That may very well be true. 
But to reiterate again, we've not yet had confirmed evidence of this. What we can say is that the situation on the battlefronts itself continues to deteriorate sharply for Ukraine. And yesterday I spoke about how the Russians appear to have broken through into Ocheretino itself, this small village to the north of Avdevka, which, however, is apparently on a hill. It sits bestride a big railway line, and it opens the way, if it is captured, for the capture of all sorts of other potential places, either Pokrovsk, if the Russians were to decide to move westwards, northwestwards, or um, perhaps even more dramatically, if they decided to move northeast from Ocheretino, they could threaten the remaining Ukrainian forces um, in Donbass with ultimate encirclement. Anyway, this morning we got conclusive confirmation that the Russians have indeed entered Ocheretino. And they haven't just entered Ocheretino, but they actually captured several buildings there. And it seems there's a fight ongoing for this particular village, but it looks as if Ukrainian defenses at the moment are disorganized and that the Ukrainians have been taken aback by the speed and ferocity, if you like, of the Russian advance and that they've been caught on the back foot. And we're also getting reports that the Russians are now no longer just advancing northward up the H20 road to the, um, west, to the east of Novokalinova and Keramik, these two other villages, but that they're now attacking these villages as well, that they're now taking steps to storm these two villages. Now, the Ukrainian troops between Ocheretino and Novokalinova and, um, and Keramik look increasingly as if they are at risk of being taken in a vice. Uh, probably an intense encounter battle is taking place around these places. I'm going to make a guess that General Sirsky is again going to try and pull troops from various places along the front lines to try to hold the Ukrainians back. Uh, the, the Russians back and to try to stabilize what is now, I think, unequivocally a collapse. It's probably not a collapse which is you know, fully irretrievable, but we're no longer talking about a slow motion collapse. We're talking about a rapid collapse. And I'm going to suggest that this is very much always been the Russian objective in this part of the battlefronts. There was those long, grueling battles fought at the end of last year for the villages of Stepovoy and Berdichi and advances up the railways. It all looked very slow and incremental. Everybody, of course, associated those battles with the battle for Avdevka. As it turned out, the actual Russian attack on Avdeevka came from a completely different direction, from the south and the east, not from the north at all. The Russians weren't aiming to create a cauldron round Avdeevka or encircle Avdeevka. They understood that that would take them the better part of a year probably to do. Instead, what they were doing is even as they were preparing the ground for their major offensive to capture of Devka. They were also in attacking the villages of Stepovoye and Berdici and advancing up the railway towards Ocheretino. They were paving the way for the actual offensive towards Ocheretino, seeking to capture Ocheretino, Keramik, and Novokalinova, which we are seeing playing out now. And the Russians also, by some accounts, have entered Novobakhmutivka, which is this other village to the west of the railway, cutting off the road to Berdichi, 
And by the way, we've got very little news today about what's actually going on in Berdici, um, but probably um, the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which is still trying to cling on to the outskirts of Berdici, and which has been in almost constant combat since, the, uh, since June of last year, when it spearheaded Ukraine's um, uh, summer offensive. Anyway, I get the sense that the um, 47th Mechanized Brigade um, is now itself in significant jeopardy and at risk of encirclement and could potentially um, decide to retreat from Berdici, bringing down upon itself, no doubt, all the anger and demands for its disbandment that we're starting to see coming out from what is clearly an increasingly panicky Kiev. So anyway, that's the situation um, north of um, Avdevka, a pending collapse. I should say that if Ocheretino falls, then it seems that Ukrainian positions to the west um, start to unravel as well. Um, there is less news today about what's going on in Umanske and uh, Yasnobrodovka and Natalovo. There were lots of reports over the last few days of the Russians attacking these three villages and storming these three villages, which is likely true, but with all the attention now on what's happening in Ocheretino, Novokalinova and Keramik, we're not getting enough reports. We're not getting many reports about what's going on in these places. But suffice to say, if Ocheretino falls, a novo Bakhmutovka falls, and Berdici falls, Semenovka having al already now largely fallen, then the Ukrainian defenses in Umansky, Yasnobrodovka, and Natalovo are in severe je jeopardy and will also co collapse. And I was talking about um, the situation in Krasnogorovka, the town to the south of Avdevka. I've said in the past that if Pervomaisky were to be captured by the Russians, um, it was likely, it was a certainty that Krasnogorovka would fall soon after. We're getting more and more reports today that there is an ongoing collapse of the Ukrainian defences in Krasnogorovka as well, which is exactly what we would expect to see following the fall of Pervomaisky. Now, I think it was yesterday, my last video, I discussed the fact that a Russian tank, or rather not a tank, an armoured vehicle of some kind, some kind of wheeled vehicle, was seen manoeuvring around the central parts of Krasnogorovka without encountering any sign of resistance whatsoever from um, any Ukrainian defenders. It was able to drive around um, various buildings and there was an eerie silence as far as one could tell and nothing seemed to be happening. And I said that this was not, as some people suggested, an attempt by the Russians to um, ascertain where the Ukrainian defences were in Krasnogorovka. That would have been a suicide mission. And as I said, I don't get the impression that the Russian military is in the practice of undertaking suicide missions or asking its troops to undertake them. Um, it looked to me like a reconnaissance which went deeper and further into Ukrainian positions as it became increasingly clear that the Ukrainians had withdrawn from those positions. And today, sure enough, we're getting reports that the Russians have now captured the entire southeast of Krasnogorovka and control 40% of the central area of Krasnogorovka, apparently an industrial area, 
judging from the maps, and I'm not the best person to read maps, the Russians now occupy around half of Krasnogorovka. That might be wrong, it might be less than that, it might even be more than that. But it looks to me that just as Ukrainian defences around Ocheretino look like they're crumbling, or, or rather not crumbling, collapsing, the same is starting to look like it might be the case in Krasnogorovka as well. Now, I've mentioned in various programs that the 3rd Assault Brigade, the former Azov Brigade, has apparently refused to be refused orders to go to Chasov Yar and to defend Chasov Yar, where the Russians are also attacking. I forgot to mention that the defenses in Krasnogorovka, that the force that had been defending Krasnogorovka um, over the last few weeks appears to have been mainly, though not exclusively, the Third Assault Brigade. So what looks like it has happened is that Sierski withdrew the Third Assault Brigade from Krasnogorovka, probably in anticipation of a general retreat from Krasnogorovka after Pervomaisky fell and ordered it to redeploy to Chasov Yar. And the Third, Assault, as a, the Third Assault Brigade is, of course, refusing to go to Chasov Yar, but the key point is that it's apparently been withdrawn from Krasnogorovka. And that probably explains, to a great extent, the ongoing collapse of Ukrainian defences there. There are still some Ukrainian troops in Krasnogorovka. The battle for Krasnogorovka is not yet ended. The Ukrainians are still defending themselves there. But it is clear, at least to me, that the main battle for Krasnogorovka is now behind us and that the Russians are well on the way to capturing this important town. So Krasnogorovka about to fall, Ocheretino now under attack and perhaps about to fall, uh, Novokalinova and Keramik being stormed and perhaps encircled, Ukrainian defense lines along the Umansky, uh, Yasnobrodovka, Natalovo um, line um, being stormed and perhaps collapsing as well. I spoke yesterday about how the Russians are punching a huge hole through Ukrainian defenses in um, the Avdevka area, the strongest defenses Ukraine has, which are located in this area of central Donbass. And that is exactly what we're seeing. Just say. So let's press forward look at things that are happening in other places. We've had less information over the last few hours about what's going on in Chasov Yar. My sense is that the Russians have, having captured a lot of ground around Chasov Yar, they now occupy, it appears, most, perhaps all, of the village of Bogdanovka, though clearly the positions there are still contested. There's reports that they're also now working towards capturing the village of Kalinina on the hill near the, um, Bogdanovka. They seem to have taken positions in the northern part of the micro district and we've got lots of reports about how they're steadily advancing from Ivanivska or Krasnoye if you prefer to use the Russian name towards the canal um, in order both to outflank Ukrainian defenders in the micro district and also to prepare a further advance on Chasov Yar from the southwest once they establish or build pontoon bridges over the micro district. Anyway, intense fighting is going on around Chasov Yar, and intense bombing is going on around Chasov Yar. Uh, the Russian Air Force is extremely busy in this area. It is busy right across the front lines, by the way but it seems to be particularly busy uh, around Chasov Yar. My guess, again, is that all of this is preparatory for an operation to storm 
Chasofia, not just the micro district, um, over the course of May, probably. Um, so expect a major battle for Chasofia next month. That's a guess on my part, but it seems to me the indications are clearly pointing in that direction. Sirsky again, has been redeploying forces. He's seen some Kupiansk to try to hold the Russians back in Chasov Yar. Of course, as has been pointed out by several people, if the Russians capture Ocheretino and the Avdevka sector and start to pivot northeastwards, then the potential exists for the Russians to start attacking Ukrainian positions around Konstantinovka and Chasofyar, the two places that we're talking about now, from the rear, from the southwest. Whether that is the Russian plan, I have no idea. I'm not going to guess, but anyway, we can see how the battle is developing and is developing for the Ukrainians in a very negative way. Now, there's also been news from Siversk. As I said, I think the battle for Siversk, like the battle for Vuglada, is probably on the horizon, but is not being conducted in earnest. I suggested in this program how the fighting around Stepovoye and Verdici in the autumn was not at directly related to the fight for Evdeevka. As we all assumed at the time, it was rather an attempt to prepare the way for the eventual Russian advance towards Osheretino. I think that we're seeing something very similar now in the Siversk area, the Russians are currently conducting operations in Belogorovka, one village in Lugansk region that the Ukrainians still control. There are pictures of Russian troops advancing through the chalk quarry to the northeast of Belogorovka. Um, and there's clearly a lot of fighting going on around there. They do seem, the Russians do seem to be gradually edging towards capturing Belogorovka. There's also reports that they've um, advanced further towards the villages, through the villages to the immediate west of Siversk, and also up the railway towards Vimka. But I get the sense that, that there is a lot of fighting going on here and a lot of bombing again by the Russian Air Force. This battle, like the battle in the south, involving Vugleda, to which the fighting in Novomikhailovka and Georgievka is connected, that those battles <coughs> are still awaiting us. They might be, if we assume, Chasofya falling in May, it may be the, the turn of Siversk, and Vuglada will come in June. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, that's the situation on the front lines. It is very, very bad for Ukraine. And um, um, Dima, in his very latest update on Military Summary Channel, is suggesting that having basically punched this hole through Ukrainian defenses in the Avdevka sector, if there is a big Russian offensive in the summer, as many expect, exploiting this hole, advancing through this hole, might be what the Russians are most plausibly going to do. And that might involve sending troops through this hole, through Ocheretino, to outflank the Ukrainians in northern Donbass, and it might also involve and advance towards Pakrovsk, and it might also involve clearing up perhaps Siversk and Vugledar as well. In other words, bring the whole of Donbass under Russian control, opening the way ultimately for an advance towards the Dnieper. 
And that seems to me entirely plausible and very consistent with what the Russians have been doing up to this time. Anyway, we will have to wait and see. But as I said, for me, the situation as it stands remains is critically bad in Ukraine and getting worse. Now, even as that is happening, we're now getting reports that Speaker Johnson has f uh, finally resolved to put to the House of Representatives votes for appropriations for funding for Ukraine, for um, Taiwan, and for Israel. In the case of Ukraine, it is the full $61 billion package, except, of course, that it's when you go through the figures, it turns out that it is not, in fact, $61 billion, because the biggest single item, $24 billion, is to restock U.S. arsenals, which have been depleted as a result of the weapons that have already been supplied to Ukraine. The idea is that Ukraine will get a loan of $14 billion to buy arms from the United States. There will be a loan. Ukraine is a massively over-indebted country. How it's expected to repay any loan is nobody really explains. The loan, there is a provision in this bill that the president can waive 50% of this loan at the end of this year, which no doubt is what is going to happen. The reality is, as I'm sure everybody knows, Ukraine is never going to pay this money back. And this is simply a dodge to try to keep um, Republican supporters in the country happy. But $14 billion in terms of weapons, $8 billion in terms of financial support. Lots of questions as to why Speaker Johnson has capitulated in this way. And there's been suggestions from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene that he's been blackmailed, things of that kind. I don't think that it is actually that difficult. The strongest indicator over the last few weeks that the pressure on Johnson to put an appropriations bill for funding for Ukraine to a vote in the House, the strongest indicator that the pressure to do that was becoming overwhelming was coming from the fact that House uh, the, the chair, the chairman of House committees, various House committees, who are of course all Republicans, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Intelligence Committee, the Defense Committee, were lining up and were increasingly demanding that appropriations for Ukraine be provided. And Johnson, who is in a very difficult political position, caught between a rock and a hard place, the Republican um, popular, the Repo populist wing of the Republican Party, which does not want to see more funding for Ukraine, and the Republican establishment in Congress, both in the Senate and amongst Republicans in the House of Representatives. Well, he has been put in a very difficult position because I suspect what he has been told straightforwardly is that if he's not prepared to put these bills to the House for a vote, then the um, Democrats will present their petition to override his refusal to put these bills to the House. It's likely that a significant number of Republicans would vote with the Democrats on that petition. The bills would be presented and Johnson would be forced to resign. Um, whereas Johnson probably calculates that his chances of survival as Speaker and perhaps as a significant political figure in the United States are greater if instead of 
doing that, he defies the populist wing of the Republican Party. That this time there might be enough um, support for him within the Republican Party to stave off the same thing happening to him that happened to his predecessor, Speaker McCarthy. So I, I don't think that this is difficult to understand. U.S. parliamentary politics are incredibly complicated and very difficult. I am not an expert in them. Um, it's always been clear to me that there has been a majority in Congress, both in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, for a um, continued appropriations for Ukraine. And there was always a strong possibility, and now it looks like a certainty, that at some point, given that the existence of that majority, those appropriations would pass. It will not be popular with the Republican base. The Republican base had been told that the Republicans would not agree to this unless there was some agreement to secure the border, an issue which concerns the Republican base in the country far more than the, than the question of support for Ukraine. And that will no doubt play out in all sorts of ways come the November election. But it remains the case that there is a civil war underway within the Republican Party. It is not concluded. The populist wing appears to be gradually gaining ground. Their candidate is now Donald Trump, who is from the populist wing, in fact, he leads it. He himself, of course, is never consistent on these issues. So it's not surprising that the vote has turned out or that events have played out the way they have. Whether Speaker Johnson will survive as Speaker beyond the vote that will now apparently take place on Saturday is a completely different matter. I'm not going to, um, I'm not frankly particularly interested in what happens to him. That is for Republicans in the House of Representatives to decide. But anyway, the key thing to understand, and it's a point that has been made by all sorts of people, most recently now by J.D. Vance, is that even if this funding bill is passed, which it almost certainly will be, it is not going to change the situation on the battlefronts. The latest wonder weapon, as you see from the text of this bill, which has clearly been largely drafted by those committee chairmen that I was talking about, is to supply apparently un un infinite numbers of attackums missiles to Ukraine. We've had Storm shadows and scout missiles supplied to Ukraine. We've had pressure on the Germans to supply Taurus missiles. This time, it's Attackham's missiles. They're not going to change the situation. Whenever these weapon systems are introduced into Ukraine, the Russians eventually find means to counter them. All that the United States is going to do as a result of this appropriation is that even if $24 billion is being assigned to restock American arsenals, it's going to deplete those arsenals even faster because the Ukrainians will be buying, presumably, existing weapons with the $14 billion dollars that they have just, that they're going to be given, even if it is in the form of a loan, which will deplete the arsenals, whereas the $24 billion are for new production, which will take years. So it seems astonishing, but it is nonetheless true that the United States, despite all that's happened, over the last two and a half years, 
apparently continues to be determined to dissolve itself ever more quickly, to give away its weapons ever faster in a war that is increasingly lost. One can understand why people in the military-industrial complex are going to be delighted by this. From their point of view, this is the best possible outcome. They're now going to have juicy new contracts piling up, which is going to make them even richer than they already are. And of course, the MIC has been a major factor in putting pressure on those committee chairs to put pressure on Speaker Johnson. So all that makes complete and total sense. If, however, you are a military officer or a senator or a representative worried about the overall military readiness of the United States, seeing the way the Ukrainians burn through weapons, seeing what is actually happening on the battlefield, weighing in the fact that that vast amount of weapons that the United States gave to Ukraine in 2022 and 2023 did not win the war, and another 14 billion isn't going to win the war either. Um, well, you would suppose that those people by now would have grasped the point and would be holding back from doing more of the same. There are some people in the United States who get it, people like Samuel Charrow at the Council for Foreign Relations, for example. Senator J.D. Vance, of course, is another such person. But emotion, anger, fury at the fact that the Russians are winning, an inability to agree to a um, negotiated outcome to the war, pride, Vanity, conceit, factors of face, the material attractions of the donations through the lobbyists that the various political um, machines of members of Congress receive, which ultimately come from the MIC, the need to keep on good terms with media outlets to continue to get invitations to the big media channels to pontificate there. All that is resulting in this decision, which is going to leave the United States weaker and which is going to make the defeat more complete. Well, this is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and subscribe. Start links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop. You can find all kinds of amazing things there. Magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. Last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon. Have a very good day.